Thanks. Hopefully, we're not ending up in a post-lunch dip. I fall asleep. Um, I'm going to hopefully keep you entertained for the next 45 minutes because we're going to talk about assessing third-party libraries more easily with using a security scorecard project. So, first of all, it's always polite to introduce yourself. So, my name is Neil Stanis. I work as a security researcher for Vercode, and I've got a background in .NET development. Been doing .NET development like since the early bits, the early 2000s, with the first versions. Um, but always was in, infected by software security, application security. And in 2015, I joined Vericode, where right now I focus mostly on what we do for static analysis, and that's mostly .NET. Um, I'm also enjoying Rust lately quite a lot, nice language. Uh, and I also do a lot of public speaking like this. Um, OWASP is, of course, a good audience as well, but I also do a lot of developer conferences, and that's the reason why I'm also a developer technologies MVP for Microsoft. If you want to talk more about Vericode, come see me afterwards. I do have quite a couple of slides where I include some of our metrics, so I'm not going to talk about products. Bear with, that, bear with me, I'm going to point that out. Um, because first, let us define the problem space we're going to talk about. And I think I've literally used this drawing the last two years for each of my talks that I'm doing on different topics, which all like eventually uh, can be drawn in the same way. Everybody probably knows XKCD. Um, the, the SQL injection one, that's the most famous one, but this one has to do with the all-modern digital infrastructure. But you can, of course, replace this by saying this is the all-modern application architecture. We stack stop, stuff on top of each other, right? And relying on open source and libraries that are already there, thats that's, I think it's a good thing. Um, being lazy myself as a developer, you want to reuse that's already there. But we also put a lot of trust, right, by piling up those bricks. And if something goes wrong with that one single brick that's at the bottom, which thanklessly has been maintained since 2003 by somebody, uh, that's a risk, right? It's good that we reuse that's already there, and you don't want to reinvent the wheel, but there's also a lot of risk tied to it. And I think we can do better in that in, in order to understand this. So that's exactly what we're going to do. First, uh, because I want to give the full stretch of the story, I'm going to talk about some of the risks that we're facing, some of the stories you probably already have heard. Um, um, that's just like the whole storyline. Then we're going to move into the OpenSSF scorecard, which of course feels a bit weird if you're at an OWASP conference talking about OpenSSF, but it's an open source project. It has some goodness in it on how it looks into the stuff that we're going to see later on. Um, we're going to do that. Then we're going to move to measure new and improved. Um, I've got some metrics to show that I think secure scorecards definitely have value for usage, like how we can use it. And I also have some signs of like, hey, I would love to see stuff that's improved um, by the checks that they do and so on, right? But we're going to do that. And at the end, there will be uh, definitely q and I'm going to be around for the rest of the conference as well, so we're going to work it out. So first picture you see over here is, of course, one that I generated. So the first talk, version of this uh, talk I gave at a conference with had a Star Wars team. So you want to do Lego Star Wars combined, and you get this, which has a weird uh, nutrition label naming on it. But... We're going to look into that, that type of concept. So looking at, at code bases on average, um, this is a code cartoon that's been drawn by Lynn Clark. She's part of the Bytecode Alliance. She does a lot of drawings on WebAssembly, but once again, we're going to see a lot of these here as well, but these are all concepts that we have in each technology stack. Um, also, if I'm referring to an article or referring to a source, then there's a notes version of my slides, which will be at the end in my GitHub. You can find like all the links to everything you need. So don't worry about that too much. But technically, you could say, and there are several studies, that 80% of the code that we use is somebody else's. And 20% is the stuff we write ourselves. If you put in a library, you might use a real small portion of it, right, or a framework, not necessarily everything, but you will drag it along. It will be there. And what happens with dependencies that we take during our development? It turns out that according to our, we have a, a thing called State of Software Security we publish each year, and you're going to see it, I think, three more times during this presentation. But in our uh, 11th edition, we looked into open source, and we concluded the following thing, that almost 80% of the time, developers never update third-party libraries that are added to a project, which is quite worrisome, right? Because a lot of stuff happens, and um, there's a mo much more graph in it, and uh, I will, I will, we're also going to use the same data on OpenSSF scorecard later on, so you will see more. But definitely, I think this is, this is a problem space. So last year, end of last year, we had a second anniversary of uh, the thing that happened for Log4J. 
And Chris Eng, our chief research officer, digged into our, the data and digged into our data to see like, hey, have we learned from what happened at that point in time? So because we like have a lot of apps, unique apps being analyzed, we were able to take 40,000 unique applications and check it against like, hey, what is the current state of, in this case, the Java Log4j version that they use? Turns out that close to 3% are still using a vulnerable version, right? Log4j, Log4Shell, what happened? Code execution based on, I believe it was like a format string problem that was inside. But that thing was literally put everywhere, right? Things are popping up. There are probably things talked about which were not necessarily true, but that thing was literally running in a lot of places. Um, it turns out that close to 4% did patch the first version, but if you have looked into the story, you will see that there was a sequence of patches done because the first patch was not enough. Then there was the second, there was a whole series. And then the thing that even worries me most is that close to 30, or it's 32%, uh, use a version that's end of life. So, uh, right? No updates, never. And that's, that's a, that's a bad thing, I guess. So, have we learned? Not completely true. It's good that we still keep an eye on these types of statistics. And as I said, we want to know if we use libraries, what are they capable of doing, right? So I'm a .NET guy, and I will probably talk a lot about .NET, and I hopefully have some inclusions of, of, of Node.js and, and Maven, the whole ecosystem is tied to that. But if you look at a dependency tree, and if you add a package to your solution, which like a Java or a .NET one, um, a package never comes on its own, right? A Maven a thing you pull in, or a NuGet package you pull in, or a Rust crate for that matter, will always have a list of transitive things you get with that for free. And what happens if a process starts, the, the package that comes with the, uh, with the whole, um, like the whole app solution itself, will have the same system access as, uh, as, the, as the root process, right? At least for .NET, it's the case. If you have a DLL that, 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 that is part of a, an app that started, then he will have all the same access unless it's been locked down, right? Of course, defense in depth is a good idea, but by default, it will have access to anything. And what happens over time, packages can become malicious. I like these drawings as well, right? Right now it has a, a mask on its face and it's become malicious, which, of course, it can decide to do other things. Um, and does this happen with ecosystems? Yes. And there are so many examples. Of course, this is related to uh, NPM, and I think it was uh, November of last year, but there's like a lot of articles where they point out like, hey, there's been additional stuff put in developer libraries that are used a lot or based on, let's say, typos, right, in, labor, in the li in library names, you're able to pull that one in and you'll get some additional stuff for free that you don't want. So that's not a good thing. Um, same counts for uh, .NET. For example, a NuGet package can integrate with the build system in a certain way, and that has a loophole itself that people can misuse. And there's a lot of research, hope that luckily there's a lot of research done to surface these kind of problems that we know that packages will have malicious things inside. And this might focus on things that you hear about, like uh, cryptocurrencies being stolen from a machine. That's the target that they want. But there's also people who have different intent, right? Maybe bigger, financially motivated actors that will want to achieve a lot more. Um, I think it was uh, 2021 when this was published. It was a, a piece of research that was done by the University of Minnesota, where they got banned from the Linux kernel. And what they did is they st had some modules that they started out working on and contributing to uh, as a research. And then, of course, at the end, they uh, showed that it was quite easy to become malicious, to become something like flip a switch or do stuff that uh, you don't want it to do. People were, of course, a bit worried, like, hey, why do you do this? And I think, as I said, they were banned for life. But does this stuff happen in the real world? And this, of course, what we saw um, with XC, right, with the library over here. And especially if you uh, look into the whole story around behind it, um, I think it, they, they had like a time window of three years where they were doing this type of work. They downgraded the way fuzz testing was done on the project. They made sure that it, that the part that they were working on fell off. Of course, there were some conditions on the back door. And I think the, even the most worrying uh, thing that worries me the most is the, the way that it was found. Because a developer from, I think it was uh, Azure Postgres database at Microsoft, run some tests and felt the timing was a bit off than it normally would be. And then he decided to look into the details and realized there was additional stuff being put in, right? So only after looking into it, he was able to identify this problem. So that's the thing with malicious things, right? And 
not to like, especially talking about this story, I cannot imagine that this is the only instance of this happening, especially if people want to really achieve something. Um, you're not going to like focus on a single thing. That's my take on it. So we need to keep an eye out as an industry to make sure that we capture these types of incidents. Malicious, that's the first thing. The other thing will happen is vulnerabilities are found all the time, right? And that's, of course, um, a good thing. Hopefully, they get properly disclosed. And we get a bulletin pulled out, right? This is a, a .NET advisory that talks about a thing that was found. If a person plays along the rules and um, submits in the right way, bug bounties are awarded and you can make money out of it, that's a, that's a good thing. Um, having vulnerabilities, it's quite easy. If you're a .NET developer, you can just go to the .NET CLI and even ask for the .NET CLI to give you the vulnerable packages of your solution. It's there for free. It's a developer tool, right? And why don't use it? I think that's the best moment. If you do it, right, just check it. Make sure you do the include the transitive ones. By now, I think right now the default is not transitive. I think with .NET 8, we will, .NET 9, we will see that this will be the default if you do a build. And it will even break the build for you if you have believe like certain high vulnerabilities in, in, in your solution. Of course, we can do the same with NPM, right? NPM has ordered, does the same for you, will show you stuff uh, that's wrong. And because we're at an OWASP conference, we can always use uh, the dependency check as well to get this thing surfaced and make sure that we have no known vulnerabilities. Um, and as I said before, looking at XE like in order to figure out what happened, we need to have a good idea of what's inside. And there was a piece of research done by a company called Reversing Labs where they looked into some of the .NET bits and pieces. And once again, as I said, I'm, I'm, I'm doing a lot of .NET. So what they figured out is that um, there were certain packages that were using hard-linked DLLs inside of it. So not necessarily having a relation with another package, right? So having a transitive relation to another package that's in the system that will be visible for everybody. But I figured out that somebody used also, I think it was gzip compiled inside of a package, which was used quite a lot. gzip can, as far as I'm aware, only be built from source. There's no binary you can grab. And it turned out that that thing had vulnerability since 2005, the version that they used. And that's still in a package, tucked away. You don't see it because it's like, a minute's code, how they would call it from a .NET space, right? You do a call out to that library and it will help you out. So we need to have a better sense of what's inside. And that's in essence what I want to talk about. We need to have a better way of assessing risk. And wouldn't it be nice if we have a nutrition label for software? So people who are um, familiar with this drink, Club Mate, you can look up the nutrition facts that are put on the bottle, which says like, hey, this has and this is a bit weird because this is a U.S. Uh, uh, label, but it says per serving it has, I think, almost 16 grams of sugar, three cubes of sugar, right? So you should question yourself if you want to drink it or not. Um, but this gives you the sense of you can go to a grocery store around the corner here and grab a piece um, and look into what the nutrition effects are of that piece and if it's a good thing to eat or not. Um, that's quick. And I think we should have the same for software, and I think that's the reason why scorecards uh, were introduced and the goal of scorecards is to allow you to quickly assess third-party libraries on what their security is and what their posture is in security right marking off risks and giving it a score if you go to the website and if you scroll down you will see the aim is to be automated and i think that's also a key thing you want to have an automated check and you want to have something that you could just run gives you the data and you can look into it and it has a set of rules um, and a set of rules are based on Conditions. So the outcome of the checks itself will have a score, scoring from varying from 0 to 10, in which a 10 is really good, 0 is bad. And it will have different rules, and we're going to go through the rules in a bit, which also will create and will be part of the scoring. But there's also a bit of risk tied to it, right? Certain things are critical and will weigh in higher on the total amount of score compared to the low ones, which have less of a, an effort, but um, have less of a like, portion within the whole score, but it will still be part of it, right? And they also have defined like several areas where they look into, right? It's about maintenance, like how well is code maintained, how actively is code maintained, um, and that kind of thing. Um, single contributor or not, right? Might be a risk, as we've seen before in the XKCD drawing. Um, does it do con any continuous testing? And of course, uh, does it have any known vulnerabilities, which hopefully should be pretty easy to figure out. And there are two things related to the fact that we have source and output, right? We do things with source we want to secure, and we also have systems uh, that we need in order to build. 
the applications, right? And that's the build assessment. So these are all the areas that make up the, the, the scorecard itself. And let's go through uh, the rules and define why they are there. So looking at what one of the first checks it does, it will go to OSV, which is just an open like database. You can uh, query it yourself right now. And you can say, okay, uh, give me all vulnerabilities uh, for this package. And in this case, I'm looking up a list that's all the things that were found in NuGet. Sometimes there's even not like a CVE tied to it, right? It's not publicly disclosed, or over here you see maybe a GitHub identifier, but it will give you the ability. Once there is a known vulnerability that has not been fixed, right, uh, it will have influence on the score, and it will have a high in the whole uh, calculation that is done. The second thing is, does it have any um, dependency update tool installed? And that can either be, I believe, dependable or renovate bot. Um, and it will be looking for its presence. I think that's one downside. It will only check if it's there, and it won't necessarily look into, like, what's the outcome of it, and did it really, like, have pull requests being processed after it for changes, right? I think that's, of course, hard to do, but that's definitely open. It's, it, this is a pretty binary check. You will either have a zero or a 10. Um, that makes it, uh, yeah, maybe a bit like... Um, Hopefully, there's somewhere in the middle. I can see it's hard. Um, but as I said before, out-of-date dependencies can be an issue, right? We want to keep track of it, so that's the reason why you should have this in. Another thing is, does the project define a security policy? If you're um, running into an issue uh, and you want to reach out to the project team, like what will be the best way to communicate with them according to like what do they want, right? If you're doing it for a bigger commercial company, they probably have certain guidelines if you want to be eligible for a work bounty. Uh, but others will just have contact details, like, hey, reach out to this email address or use this key to maybe encrypt a message if you want to do it, if it's really sensitive. But the policy itself will show people like what it will take in order to get stuff fixed, to get stuff reported. That's a good thing. Um, this thing really has uh, has a real uh, expected effect on the outcome once we look into the metrics. I think this one is pretty cool. Although it's just like a medium in the total score, it definitely shows that security has been taken seriously by the project. I think that that's the take on it, right? Same counts for license. If there's no license, that might be a risk from legal perspective, right? You might not be able to use it. Maybe the corporate like environment you work in might not allow you to use it. But um, it will give information like how it will be, how it's used or how it's not used. Can you even reverse it or look into it, right? That might be a question. But if there's no license, that might be a risk for your organization. The other thing they look into is uh, best practices in relation to CII. And this is a project that they adapted. And the nice thing about this is like all the other checks I just talked about are all automated ones. This one is an attestation that each project can do themselves by filling out a form. And then a person will review all the stuff that they do. And you will, you can go up to the checks list. You will see that there is a, um, a form people need to fill in and they need to explain how they work with their build systems. Um, Keep in mind, like I mentioned scorecards, um, and I mentioned a lot of GitHub, but this works on GitHub and GitLab repositories. So that's where the checks are being able to, to be executed on. Um, some of them might be more focused towards GitHub, but you can run on both. It's not necessarily uh, exclusive. So it's a nice thing. You will earn a badge, and this will help in the score, of course. Um, the same counts for continuous testing. Hopefully, the team uh, will do some unit tests or some integration tests after stuff is done after pull request gets processed, um, makes sense, right? It's quality assurance. There are certain metrics it will take into account in order to calculate the score. The same counts for fuzzing. Um, it will try to understand if there's a fuzzing project included or if it does fuzzing on its own. Uh, fuzzing, of course, helps out because it will throw some unstructured data against the project uh, and see how it behaves. You could always question yourself, does it work for any managed language, right? Does it make sense to fuzz Java-based libraries or .NET-based libraries? I'm going to get to that uh, once we're going to talk about improvement stuff. But um, a presence of this project, and there's even a couple of more in the list right now, as I saw this morning, uh, will give it a better score, right? Because you do fuzzing. It's not necessarily looking into the output and what's been done with that, but the fact that it's there, um, that will be the thing. The same counts for static code analysis, right? And seeing the two names over here, I would say there's definitely room for improvement because we're not on it. But um, this is also quite a binary check. It will just check if one of those two things, and I think even the older version of CodeQL is present, and if it's being executed. But that's it. 
It doesn't look into results. And you could also argue like how much value will you get out of analyzing a package or a library, right? I've got some takes on that at the end. There's definitely room for improvement. What about binary artifacts? Executable put into a GitHub repo that's part of a package. How are you able to identify what's inside that executable and what the purpose of it is, right? Let's say if it's nuget.exe, it probably is there for a reason because of the build. Makes sense, right? Um, but it will be hard if there's another executable, like what, what source was used to build that executable? It's, it's totally not transparent. And that's, that's a risk. Um, because they cannot be reviewed and we should always aim for reproducibility in builds. I'm going to touch that at the end. Um, same counts for branch protection. And this is a get of specific one, but it will check how the branches are configured. And it will also prevent a, fo a, a force push on a branch because that will take care of the history and the history will be gone, which might be a risk, right? So making sure that there also is a requirement of code review that there's a workflow for people to push changes in will give it a better quality uh, assurance compared to if it's not there. Same counts for um, dangerous workflows, which has been put as critical. So that's the highest you can get in this whole scoring. Um, there are certain bad practices if you look at GitHub Actions, and there's a real good blog that they wrote themselves on what you need to, to look into. I think a good example of this was something that happened with VS Code two years ago. Uh, somebody figured out that if you file an issue with a pull request included, that one gets run in a nightly thing, in a nightly task, and it turned out that the person was able to add additional files to the output of the code version that was generated on that. Uh, was properly disclosed, probably earned money out of it, which is cool, but that was all due to the fact that the issue input was used inside of the build actions that were taken afterwards, which is one of those best practices, or bad practices that they talk about. Same counts for code review, and um, it will determine, it will try to determine, but, and I think the key will be like the, the merger needs to be the different person compared to the committer, right? I think that's the whole workflow we probably implicitly want to check for. Um, which will make it hopefully better because more eyes have looked into it. And then the amount of contributors. And I think this is, this is a bit like two-edged sword because I'm not completely sure. Um, it will try to see how much like contributors there are and how many recently have been involved. Uh, but relying on a single person, that's not a good thing. But will a large list of contributors be a good thing, right? That's, that's the other question you could ask yourself. And to illustrate, this is a drawing. You probably cannot see all the details, but this, if you go to uh, the website NPM graph, you can generate this. This is the NPM graph of, of Electron. So everybody who uses VS Code, including myself, and Slack on your machine, you run Electron, you run this whole dependency graph of different uh, dependencies that will make up Electron. In total, there's 98 maintainers touching this code, and there's 1,100 contributors adding up to this code that end up in your IDE tools, right? So hopefully a lot of eyes with good intent, but there only needs to be one and not to be paranoid. But I think that's, 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 we need to think about that. Um, so will it be good enough? I've got some metrics to prove how this will be one or the other. I'm going to show you afterwards, like in the next part of the presentation. And then of course, looking at build dependencies and, and they need to be pinned. So for .NET, you can pin your project files to certain versions so that you are sure that if somebody else builds the project, it will have the same versions included. And the same counts for if you do GitHub actions, you should never have versions numbers in it, right? You should have a commit hash or the hash of the action that you're executing in order to make sure that you're using that one and not a new one or another one, right? If you have reviewed that, because that will give you that assurance of these are the versions that were used. We're getting close to the end. So token permissions, right? Workflows need access. These privilege is always good, a good idea on systems. Um, they check for certain things if they are defined in the workflow. And if it's a, a high token permission that's not needed, it will flag it. And the same, um, or not the same, but it's also important that the project itself is part of a packaging system, right? If you develop for NuGet or .NET, you will hopefully publish it to a NuGet repository that makes it part of the whole NuGet ecosystem. People can get updates. People can get that vulnerability information if you disclose it properly. It's there. And being part of the ecosystem makes it the key that it's going to work because people can update, install, right? And that's, that's a good thing. And this is the last one we're going to talk about, the, the signed releases. Um, it will check if artifacts are signed. 
And um, of course, there's a lot of ways you can sign uh, artifacts nowadays. Six Store is a good example, free to use. Look into that one. Um, Microsoft also has an Azure one right now that they published. Uh, if you're an OSS contributor, you can get that one for free, I believe. So there's definitely room for signing stuff. Um, doesn't necessarily say anything about the package. I think the biggest example in that case would still be what happened with SoloWinds. They had their build server compromised. The package was signed with the keys that they normally would use. And the only thing you could find out is look into the details of the binary in order to see if something bad was happening, right? So signing gives you some assurance, but it won't necessarily say that the stuff inside is good. Uh, it will also check for signed build provenance, right? So if you run, let's say, for example, um, Google SLSA, and you are able to do attestations, and you, you create those files, those provenance files, they can be checked in and signed as well, which gives somebody information on that moment in time that build server was run on this Git branch, on this commit, initiated by, by Niels, for example. You can have that assurance in the chain of custody, like how, how it ended up there. I think that's good. But it, as I said before, it doesn't say anything about the, in, in, by the content, but it's definitely a good practice. So, Enough talking, right? As I said before, this was the last part. Now we're going to move to um, a demo. And a demo where I'm going to take a scorecard and, and fetch scorecard data. So let me switch to my VS Code. Hopefully it's big enough. I made sure that I put it into white because normally it will be black, but that's not a good one on, on Beamers. Um, if you install the binary yourself on your machine, you can just say, okay, scorecard and you will point it out to a repo and in this case it's a github repo it can be github repo or gitlab repo you can also query direct ecosystem we're going to get that to that in a bit um, but you can say okay give me the scorecard on this repo and this is newtonsoft.json and if people are familiar with the .NET ecosystem that's I think top one package in the list and you can get it and it will start it will do all the checks I'm going to do it just once and we're going to bother you each time with it um, the key thing that I did do is I gave uh, the process or the environment a GitHub token to have read access to GitHub. Because if you do this on a machine that has no GitHub token defined, it will complain. It will say, hey, I need to uh, throttle down a bit because I cannot hammer the APIs within GitHub. Uh, you need to make sure that you use a read token. And once it's done, you will get this output. Um, and you can go up and you will see the full score. Let me see. So in average, it has a 3.1 out of 10, which you could argue is it good enough. But then you can go down and see all the checks. And it will also point you out to the documentation of the check that was performed and the specific version, right? Because scorecards itself are also still on the move and projects are being maintained. But this will show you like, hey, this is the version you run. This is the check that we executed. And it, it has done all the checks, right? Um, and you can go through and you can also see what it has done and what it has concluded. Marking this as a 3.1 out of 10. Is it good? Depends, right? We're going to get to that in a bit. Wouldn't it be nice if you can just do this on an ecosystem, right? As I said before, this is only doing it on, um, on a repo, but we can also do it based on a, on the ecosystem. And luckily, Scorecard itself can also point this out like, hey, I'm, I'm interested in Newton Software JSON. This will get the last version of the scorecard. But you still need to run it on your machine and grab it, right? And if you have a transitive dependency tree, as I showed before, and you need to all do it by hand, that's not going to work. Luckily, there are some good websites that we're going to look into that will have the data published already. Let me see if I open up this one. Yeah. So if you go to the viewer itself, let me, you can put in um, the package name. This is, so this is, of course, already the same repo. It will, it will show you, I need to go to the viewer. It will show you a repo you can put in. You can say, I want to have newtonsoft.json, and I should not have the, uh, the quartz mark in it. Let's, take, let's do the quartz net one. This is another project. It will have the data already there. This one is generated. And you can also just do a, a get request. You will have a JSON document with the scorecard itself, right? So this already opens up the door for automation. The only thing that this API is as a downside, it doesn't recognize ecosystems. It only recognizes Git or GitHub or GitLab repos. And we need to do the connection in between. And I was looking into it, like how would you approach this? How would you do this on your solution itself? You would like to get all the scorecards for the whole solution, right? Or like for your whole project, for your whole Java project, or for your whole uh, Node.js project. Um, 
So luckily, there's another site called devs.dev, which has that correlation. And if we, if we look here, let me, maybe I need to zoom in a bit as well. Let's select NuGet again and let's go to newtonsoft.json. You will see that the scorecard data is also there. And over here, the score is a bit different because this is probably running at a different moment in time or with a different version of the scorecard. But uh, it, it's a slightly bit lower, but it will still show the checks and you can get this data. And what I've done is I have a tool chain that is called Fennec that allows you to get this for a .NET project. And before this conference, I decided like, okay, I'm going to talk a lot about .NET. There's a lot of more technologies in this world, so I should maybe create a generalized version. I did my best. Um, I have a tool folder inside the GitHub repo published, which contains a project that will do the same for Maven, and it will also have the plumbing already done for Node.js. That will do the same stuff that I'm going to show you right now. So let me quickly go to a repo that I have on my machine, which is called Dasblog. It's a blogging engine. People who have been with the, um, is it that? Does blog core. People have, with people who have developed in .NET in the early days, there was a blogging engine, uh, blogging.net, and this one was the base, uh, that was ported to .NET core, uh, a while ago. And I always use it as a, as an example. So right now, my tool will just, let me just put in the alias. I need to do this because it's on my machine and then say it's Phoenix scorecard. You will see it will run, but it, it will recognize the .NET projects and it will grab all the data. It will grab all the dependencies and the transitive dependencies. And then it will create a folder and let's open it up. Should be open here. Yes. So right now we can see, let me close this down a bit. This one might be from a document. Yeah, this one's open. So this one is a, the HTML agility pack has a score of 4.5 out of 10, but all the checks defined, right? So this will at least give you a state like, hey, this is the software I've written. These are all the projects. And right now, as I said before, it's maybe a bit naive that the will only consist of .NET, but let's say you have a .NET backend and a, a JavaScript based frontend, there might be a combined ecosystem. I definitely have the goal of, of having a tool in that will recognize all those ecosystems. And this morning I was like, hey, why not maybe take OWASP dependency checker to recognize this because it already has all knowledge of traversing independencies and seeing file dependencies on that thing, right? So this will give you the ability to pull in data that we can use. And then still the next step is like, how could you work with this data? Um, that will be the, the, the next part. So let me move back to the slides a bit. But the scorecards, as I said, it might be a bit, um, you need to, to generate them. So it would be better just to get those uh, things uh, from a source and include them. Um, and then those are the tools and that's the goal of the tools. And as I said, the other one is in the tool folder and Fennec will be, um, if you look at my other presentation, she will find it in my GitHub as well. So as I said before, let's look into um, measurements. Let's look into how good is it and how much uh, can we trust these kinds of checks? And um, looking into it, it's funny. So e we have a state of software security we publish each year as rare code. OpenSSF also has an annual report where they talk about the amount of open source projects that they scanned. And I think um, right now they're at, at the 1 million that they do on a weekly basis, right? So they generate those scorecard data for that project. And that's quite cool. Wouldn't it be nice if we can compare it to something that has been around much longer? And of course, yes, we can do it. So uh, Chris Eng um, at RSA talked about this, where he took the data from our state of software security of this year and looked it up and correlated it back to OpenSSF scorecard data to see, hey, is there any correlation that we can do? Are there any figures that will explain to us what's happening here? Um, and this is a 50 minute talk and the link is in the slide deck at the end. So I probably won't do justice to it all. And uh, there's a lot more like where he talks about the data, but I definitely want to show you some of the snippets that I found over here, which were really interesting. The first thing that they realized when they looked into the data is that open SSF scorecard is the big circle and the smaller circle to the right, that's the data that we have. And there's a small piece of overlap. And I think in total, they concluded that 4% of the project that we'll use as dependencies, right? So what they've done is with uh, with our data looked into um, 
the open source checks, the, the, the SCH scans that were done. So this project relies on this dependencies. And then they correlated it back like, hey, does this project have a scorecard or not? It only turns out there's 4% overlap, which you could say, okay, um, what's happening here? And he also tells and explains like, it's not rocket science. So it's like, it's, there's no like real scientific rule that you need to do in order to, um, make sure. So, um, what they've done is then looked into more of the data and they said, like, okay, but you could definitely look into trends. And that's exactly what they did. And it turns out that, uh, if you would correlate it back to open SSF scores and the fact that they are present in our data or not, it turns out that the, the, the projects that are present in enterprise apps that we have scanned score higher than the one that are not in. So the red one is the bigger circle, the blue one is the circle that includes our data. And you can see on average the bars are more to the right, so the scores are higher. So that, that confirms that that, that hypo hypothesis uh, is true based on the data, how it's, it's compared. The other thing that they also do, and this is quite a, a weird thing, but they also looked into commits. So not our data, but commits and the way projects were worked on. And the cool thing is that if you look at the, the horizontal axis, that's the score of the scorecard. And in this case, uh, the vertical axis are different things. So the left, top left, has to do with the amount of contributors. And as soon as the amount of contributors increase, right, go up, you see on the right-hand side of the chart, the scores go up as well. So that confirms that it's not necessarily bad to have a large list of contributors, right? It's not that, it, that as I said, there might be one, but hopefully the other 90 or 99 will still do a better job. I think that's the conclusion that they put into this data. The same counts with committer diversity. And what they mean with that is you can have a big group of committers on a project, but if a single person still does all the work, the di committer diversity is pretty low. So they figured out a, a, a math rule. They said, okay, everybody, if everybody evenly distributed the amount of commits, then if that's the case, the score will be higher, right? Because more people work on it collaboratively like, and, and get the end result. And I think that's cool. The right-hand side has more to do with active development and last commit. And you see if the active development days in between are lower, and that's the right side of the top right chart, the scores will be higher. And of course, if there's a, a lot of days since last commit, then the project probably is also uh, stale and has more security issues. And the last thing they did, and this is also a bit of weird, so let me explain to you, but you see a list of checks, right? And the first one is dependency update tool. And this is either one of the condition checks, right? So I mentioned if there is a present tool present, then it will be true and you have a good score. If there's no tool present, then that will be the first row in this thing. There's also some of the custom rules that, that is related to the kids uh, data we saw before. But this is more like a co if uh, like like a thing. If the bar to the red is big, then the odds of a vulnerability being found on that project that's being scored by scorecard is high. Meaning that if no dependency tool is found on the project, the project probably has problems. And that's exactly what the first bar indicates. The second thing is that if there's a security policy in place, stuff gets found. That's confirmed, right? So if we have the ability to show people can respond to us on our project saying, you can fix this, then that's confirmed by that one. I think that was really weird looking at it for the first time, because if you look at static analysis tools, which is at the bottom, it will have more, uh, it will have, it will have less vulnerabilities, which also kind of makes sense, because if you do static analysis and do something with results and have security development lifecycle in general, then probably the quality of the things you do are, are much higher, right? So I think this is nicely illustrating um, what the differences are in all that data compared to data that we have. Um, and let me briefly touch some of the improvement stuff I mentioned before. Looking at fuzzing and testing, um, will it make sense to move more into it? I would say yes. And I'm going to quickly go over this a bit. So if you if you do .NET, there's a real cool project called SharpFuzz that will allow you to fuzz a thing. But the key thing that we need to be aware of is like how you would perform that fuzzing, right? You want to put the project on a bench. So if you, let's say, look into this piece of code, but it takes a Java, uh, a JSON deserialization library, you want to uh, put it on a bench and fuzz it in that way, right? And not necessarily look into other stuff. So it's all about that skeleton app and the same counts for, for like test cases in general, right? Um, there's a real cool project called Fuzzomatic, which is more focused on doing this for Rust based on an LLM. If you're interested, I would encourage you to look in that because I also briefly want to touch the same counts for static analysis. As I said, static analysis tool present doesn't necessarily mean something is good. 
If you look at this code, and if you define the whole context of the stuff you see over here, this is something that could be done by a linter as well, or even by the compiler itself, by flagging like, hey, maybe it's not a good idea to use SHA-1, right? And in this case, it's called a variable called password. It's also a big smell, but in order to do good code analysis, static analysis, I would like us to focus more on data flows, right? So putting stuff in the context how it's used, putting a library in a context how it's used, and then flowing out data, and in this case, like there's a customer ID flowing through, and then eventually there's a file name being constructed based on the data. That's a taint path that goes into that component, right? So I think we need to focus more on maybe getting that surfaced and also having good projects that will reflect like, hey, this is how the component or the library is being used and how we should test it. The other thing is about reproducibility, right? And it, we should always be able to grab source, and it would also be good if we have some proof on can we reproduce this binary based on the source code that we found. .NET has definitely got some quirks. I have a demo in the, in the, in the repo you can look into. In general, I would suggest you look into a website called reproduciblebuilds.org that will allow you to get the tools you need and also allow you to do diffing on, on DLL levels. Um, funny fact is that Mark, Mark Rusinovich two years ago explained reproducibility for Windows is hard because certain components cannot be recreated in the same way, right? That's the whole problem. So we need to look more into details. These are the tools that you can use in order to become more reproducible um, for that matter. And the last thing um, I'm going to briefly look into is something called App Inspector. This is a project that was published by Microsoft a couple of years ago, but it will look into a source repo, and it's not only .NET, I think it does a lot more technology stacks, but it will show you the capabilities it uses. Meaning that, hey, in this case, this project will also do authentication, it will do cryptography, we're most certain that that's the case. And as I said before, we need to be aware of what's inside. Do we expect some cryptography happening inside of a library that only needs to process simple numbers in order to do some math? That's not the case, right? But having it inside of a PDF library might make sense because of signature checks and so on. Right, so we need to deliberately look more into that. And the same counts for having better community reviews. I would love for us to have, at least for .NET, a better way of, of, of signing off things ourselves and that people can look it up and see it. Uh, Cargo Vet is a project that's run within uh, the Rust ecosystem that does that. It's pretty cool. Look into it if you're interested in Rust. So with two more minutes left, and I do want to open up for questions, um, I think scorecards can help out, as I've shown before, the metrics will help us, help us out understanding what's inside and know how to assess the risk better, right? And definitely just grabbing the, the scorecards itself is the first step and then having the right tools, presenting it to you in a way that you can work with it, that's the next things. I think it's important to know that scorecards itself is never a goal on its own, right? It should be a means to get to better results. And I think it would also make sense for you to look into metrics that matter to you. If you see the whole checklist, you can also run scorecards on a limited set of checks, if those are the ones that you're interested in seeing, in order to make sure that it's, it's the score that matters to you. Um, the OPSEC EU GitHub demo um, things are all in that repo, including the slides and the notes. Um, there's an article on NuGet. NuGet wants to have scoring in, in their own system. Uh, Socket Dev is a real cool visualization also of quality metrics related to Maven, Go, and NPM. I would encourage you to look into that. And the Fenix CLI, that's my tool, and hopefully the other customer tool, custom tool, um, you can find uh, in, my, in my website. So with that said, I'm going to open up for questions if there are any. With one minute left, I'm so sorry. The end might have been a bit quick, but... Um, uh, I need to make sure that we wrap up on time. Uh, thank you, Niels. Um, so, as Niels said, we are open for questions. Uh, if you have any, just uh, come here and ask your question. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, you use the example of comparison between a nutrition fact on food, yeah. which is the for Cyclone DX, they do the same analogy, the same comparison. So can we say that the, the scorecard is like Cyclone DX for dependency plus checking the vulnerability? How, how do you compare them and... Uh, Cyclone DX, of course, is more like an S-bomb of, of yes, a, dependency, a full dependency graph, right? I think this can be complementary data that you can include, right? At first, you want to know exactly which versions you have uh, put into the software that you release, right? That's the S-bomb. And this can be additional data. And it's more like a, 
you use it for risk assessment, right, up front, and not necessarily, I guess, after the fact. It's more like that moment in time you want to know what the security posture is of a library that you're planning on using. Uh, and I think that's the difference compared to having an S-bomb that's being written there and that will be stored in order to look up. So okay. I think it's complementary to what you try. Okay. Uh, the other question, what programming languages are supported by scorecards? Everything that's in GitHub. So and I'm sorry for the people who saw a lot of that. As I said, that's my comfort zone. But every project that has a GitHub repo will be uh, part of a scorecard uh, that's been generated. And you can find the data in a bigger set. The only thing, like, if you do uh, Node.js, you're only interested, like, in a, an NPM package. And then you need to do that correlation on this is the GitHub repo that was used. And another thing that I, I didn't mention, but... You can also run it on a specific commit, right? A version of a library is done on a commit that's available, and uh, you might want to look into that as well in order to okay, make sure... Including C, C++ as well? If the repo is there, we can look it up afterwards. If you have a certain project that you know is in GitHub, we can see oh. if it's there. So, But the tool itself does not depend on the specific uh, no. package no. management? No, no, no. Oh. no. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I'm um, not seeing any other questions. I have one question. Um, uh, I think this is a good tool, an interesting tool for everybody that's technical. Yeah. Um, have you thought about... Uh, a dashboard. A dashboard. Yes. 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 <laughs> for exactly. project yeah, it's, managers. It's, it's, there's, there's so much ideas and so much less, or less time, right? That's always how it works. Yes. I would love to see a transitive tree of scorecards where you have the root and then everything that's underneath even with scores and with nice colors, and then you can instantly see that's the risky one or that's the one I need to look into that I'm not certain about. In that case, that's yeah. a good one. Yeah, okay. So, um, no more questions, so... Uh, one more, otherwise... Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> yeah, quickly. <laughs> uh, yeah, still talking about transitive dependencies. Oh, yeah. sorry. Uh, which metric would you say is the higher that you would like to compare against to, to identify like the more riskier uh, dependencies that are transited? I'm sorry, come again, I don't... So uh, the, the scorecards have multiple metrics and you mentioned at the end, well, take into account the metrics that care you the most. So which one is the metric that you would care <laughs> the most for transitive dependencies? I think the most... Um like the active development and the amount of contributors, Makes I think sense. that's really a, a, a good sense. And also just practices like quality assurance testing, I think that will be a strong indicator for me. Uh, Not necessarily uh, this, the static tools or the other tools, but as I said before, the, um, the most active project, that there was a, a list of custom items in a thing, has, and that looks at the time window of those Git commits in that data. Uh, having active projects, right? If a project runs stale for two years and nobody has touched it, that will be a bigger risk, I guess, compared to one that's been actively developed. So. Okay. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you, and enjoy the rest of the conference. Okay. Thank you.